great, great couple speakers just now. I just, it's been such an informative day so far. Um, so up next we have Brian, Brian Kirkfleet of Inspiration Farms. Um, he's a co-steward of Inspiration Farms. Brian has a wide breadth of practical knowledge on how to partner with natural systems to bring forth stability and abundance. Having completed three full permaculture design certification courses, he now teaches and does consultation work for others. Brian teaches workshops at Inspiration Farm, founded in 1994, and Inspiration Farm actually has a booth just in the east wing over here as well. The focus is on food, fiber, and medicine production within a happy, healthy life and ecosystem. So without further ado, here's Brian. Clicker? Yeah, I click her, okay. which is also a feature. Okay. And when your time is, I'll, I'll have a five minute and then okay. you're done. Okay. Oh, I should put my timer on. There you go. All right. Thank you, Anka, for, and Conservation District for having me here. Um, unique opportunity to present some of this stuff. Unfortunately, I had to squeeze my presentation down to a short amount of time, so we're gonna fly through some of these slides kind of quick and um, hopefully give you the gist of what I'm trying to present here. Um, let me just go there. Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, water resilient landscapes and how some of the strategies are to design them to mitigate against some of these extremes we've been witnessing here recently and seem to be getting more common. Uh, just in the last year, we had record high temperatures, we had floods, we had super cold winters. Um, all of these things affect the way that we can grow and live in our communities. Uh, looking at all the different things that come into play when dealing with water in your landscape, you have to take these all into consideration to figure out what the right design is and the application of uh, possibilities for your landscape. So there's rain amounts, catchment areas, soils, um, the context to what your contour of your land is. All these different things come into play with uh, various strategies that you may or may not want to use as you move through. Understanding the water cycle is also really key to figuring out the best way forward. Many of us are familiar with what the, the large water cycle of evaporation off the sea, falling on the mountains, coming down the hills, in streams and rivers, and then flowing back out to sea. Many people are not as familiar with the small water cycle, which is really critical towards mitigating floods and droughts. This is the evaporation, precipitation, uh, transpiration. It's the dew, the fog, the mist, the smaller little water cycles that usually happen in a small local area, not over a continental kind of area. So we'll be talking a lot about the small water cycle and how important that is to maintaining uh, vitality in your crops and on your landscapes. Um, integrating the small water cycle throughout your um, your operation is really key to keeping the soil cool and cool soil absorbs more water into that soil cool uh, environment makes your plants happier makes your animals happier and is generally more uh, drought and fire resistant looking at a good hydrological cycle you have many of these things happening at the same time. You have this large cycle of water moving up from large bodies of water to the mountains, falling the mountains, coming down through. But then you have many, many small exchanges of these small water cycles from plant transpiration, the dew, the mist, all the, um, the soils that holds the moisture, gives that moisture off in times, and then redeposits on leaves and goes back down into the ground through dew drip. This recharges the aquifers. This uh, enlivens plant growth, which helps keep that cycle going. When you have a bad uh, water cycle, you, oftentimes you get what's called this heat island effect. And this is where hot uh, bodies of land 
uh, gets so hot that it actually pushes water off coast. It, that, that high pressure, that cool air comes in, hits that high pressure, and it gets pushed off from the coast until it builds up to such a big event, it comes in in a huge rain storm, which we've seen. The, the heat island effect is caused by cities, impervious pavements, uh, over-tilled or compacted and grazed soils um, that inhibit the water's ability to be absorbed and create that small water cycle. So you get these peak floods, peak droughts, and fires. And it's a recurring process, and that also creates a feedback loop. So to maintain this, we have to look at the whole watershed, all the way up from the mountains, how our forestry is managed, all the way down to the pastures and the estuaries and out to the sea. So there's many different uh, aspects in this, and we're not able to, to tackle all of these ourselves. We, we can often only affect the areas that our land is occupying. But to have this in our consciousness is important as a community on how we manage our water here in the Great Northwest. Many people think, hey, we got tons of water, right? But we have three months of drought in the summer. We get all our water over the winter months. And so we have to conserve that water and create these small water cycles so that that water kind of keeps circulating through those summer months. Looking at a, a farm scale integration, there's many ways that you can incorporate water into your farm uh, through ponds, swales, uh, uh, diversion ditches, terraces, uh, pocket ponds, and we'll talk about some of these. So, the biggest thing I would say in dealing with water on a landscape is to create a textured landscape. So to texture the landscape, it creates, uh, concentrates the land and it concentrates the area where water can go. They so see so many pastures in, in this county that are just flooded in the winter and then dry in the summer. And it's because that water doesn't infiltrate, it flows off and farmers want it to go away rather than creating a place for that water to, to reside and soak into the ground and create that small water cycle on site. There's a great little example of this right outside here, but it really wants, I wanted to show how like this, the, the covered ground creates more organic matter, it uh, absorbs more water, and it filters that water that does flow out. So having good soil structure is really key to creating that small water cycle uh, and, and good porosity, good life, and good, which we're all soil, right? We're all built of soil. It's, uh, you know, animals graze, the, our plants grow out of the soil, we have to take care of our soil, and it's key to, to resolving all these issues. Um, so soil has, has all these different things. It, it's, uh, filters the water, it sequesters carbon, it reduces erosion, mitigates floods and droughts, and it ultimately it builds farm resiliency. So, um, raising the organic matter in your soils, 1% can store over 20,000 gallons of water per acre in your soil. This is an invisible pond it's in your soil. So organic matter in soils, creating this soil sponge, is so critical to uh, maintaining water quality and also um, that small water cycle. So there's many different approaches to maintaining soil quality, and one of them is uh, for larger areas and pastures is this plow that's called a key line plow, which, let's see if, this is going to play. It may not. I had a little video of it in action, but this is um, what it does. It basically slices through the sod and um, allows water to infiltrate down into their roots to grow and uh, increases the water holding capacity of the soil. There's the cult air, cuts the sod so there's no disturbance on the pasture whatsoever. 
This can be done in a way that's called a key line design, which is you're, bring, you're cutting off contour, the red lines, so you're bringing the water from the valleys towards the ridges, and you're evening out that water throughout the landscape. This is a more complicated uh, view of that, and I could talk about it more. This is put it into practice on a large scale. This was put into place in two days with a dozer across a, a wide uh, landscape. You can do this and then do alley cropping where the, the lines are planted in trees and the, the inner swale areas are cultivated with cropping. Ponds are very important in the landscape. They have a lot of roles. There's a lot of different places in the landscape you can put ponds. And this is, takes a little bit of design work, but put in the right place, they really help mitigate those drought and flood events. Swales and their applications. These are ditches on contour that hold water and allow that water and nutrient load to soak in. These can be put across the landscape, again on contour, planted into trees, and then intercropped in between. Here's a swale uh, put on. It is wet in the winter, it's dry in the summer. It's a walking path, so it's not there year round. These can be all kinds of configurations from garden paths to what's called boomerang swales or smile swales. These can be going up mountain sides. And then on really, really flat areas, there's a technique called chinampas. And this is digging out ditches and piling up that soil on top so you concentrate the water and you concentrate the land. These are the, some of the most productive agricultural systems on the planet. This is Mexico City, was built on chinampas, feeding millions of people in its heyday. So that, that ha provides agricultural crops, aquacultural crops, transportation, and um, really concentrates that edge. This is how they're built. Uh, sticking willow stakes in along the edge of the bed, digging the muck out, and putting it on top, and planting into that. Here it is, kind of integrated into a kind of a farm scale. Looking at putting water into your landscapes, you can fast track succession uh, into a really developed resilient system in a much shorter period of time uh, because of the water and nutrient load that's held on the landscape. Here's kind of a large farm scale integration. This is uh, 60 hectares in Australia. They just received over uh, two meters of rain in 72 hours. This farm absorbed everything into their systems and pacified that water. Many farms next to them totally flooded and washed out. Here's another design by Sepp Holzer. You can design your property where uh, over a quarter of that land is water-based systems without losing any productivity in that landscape. It only increases productivity and it mitigates gets dr floods, droughts, fires, and it's beautiful. All right, I just barely made it. And um, this is a lot of material to take in. Uh, we are teaching a uh, class on earthworks and water water management later this summer and I also do farm consultations and happy to work with you on some of your issues and um, look at your specific situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you yeah, sure. Yeah. So if there's any questions in the crowd right now, this idea of resilience is Maybe vital for all of us in the future. That was a lot of a lot of info too. So yeah. So I have a question back here. So my husband's really worried about like butts and the pond. How do you uh, kind of work with that? Okay, that that's a very common question. Um, so a balanced ecosystem. You know, if you have a balanced ecosystem, you have frogs, you have damselflies, you have swallows, you have bats, that handles most of your pest bugs, mosquitoes primarily. Um, a lot of the water systems, like the swales, go dry in the summer. So it's just during the cold months that they're slowing spreading and sinking water. 
so it's not an issue. Most, most bug and pest issues from water bodies are in small, like hoof prints of water, buckets of water, uh, gutters, things that uh, you can't have habitat within. Great. I love that. I can picture the amphibians and the insects. <laughs> Just one second. What's your theory on permits? Um, our, our permitting is outdated for the time. We need to change some policies around that. And it's a big issue because, um, well, I totally understand and appreciate uh, preserving habitat and creating habitat and preserving waterways. Um, it do, the way that policy is right now, it inhibits farms' ability to put in waterways because then they have to have setbacks and plant only in certain specific species. And so some of those policies do need to change around that um, with the understanding that these water bodies filter water, they help hydrate the landscape, they're recharging our aquifer, they're making clean water for the salmon and the rivers, um, and they can be very productive spaces on farms without taking it out of uh, production. And also attenuating flood waters, right? Yes, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. So for the person who's new and wants to learn more about this, what's the best place to start? Oh goodness. Um, well, I, I started working with it uh, through permaculture design. So I took a permaculture design course and that has paid for itself multi-fold over in my knowledge and understanding and just how I dealt with my property. Uh, we had flood issues. And so I started looking at it with a permaculture design lens on how to, so water is not a problem, it's an asset. So in permaculture design thinking, your problem is your solution. So how can you turn a problem into a solution? And as they say, water is life. And so you don't wanna just get rid of this life providing uh, element in your landscape. You wanna see how best you can harness that. And so I took my, flood problem into a place on our farm where we don't have to irrigate at all anything. Um, our landscape is hydrated, even the last summer when it was so hot. Um, there are books, but books only take you so far. There's YouTube videos, there's a lot of different things. Um, on here you can see there's this um, new community water stories at the top. This is a worldwide effort to look at how we deal with water on a planetary scale and the small water cycle and large water cycle. There's a lot of really good information there. There's also the Global Earth uh, Repair Foundation. They're doing a lot along water and dry lands restoration. Um, and then, of course, come take my classes. Uh, we're doing an Earthworks course on uh, the, the end of August. And then we're also doing a full permaculture design certificate course this year. Awesome. And you have your card and way to sign up at your booth um, over on the east Yep. Thank you so much. Yep. Big round of applause here for you. And come back at noon. We've got our big panel discussion.